focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, we have Chang Anna and back joining us in the studio as she does every now and then, <laughs> Son Bo Kyung. Guys, welcome back. Good Happy evening. Friday. Happy Fridays to you as well. We've been talking about, of course, the release, uh, the planned release of the uh, contaminated water from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, there's been some. I guess uh, political rifts in regards to this. The ruling power uh, try to uh, understand the Japanese side on this. The main opposition party very much against uh, the idea of allowing Japan to release the, uh, the contaminated water there. But uh, we do have uh, the ruling and the main opposition parties having agreed to establish a special committee on uh, Japan's Fukushima wastewater release. A parliamentary probe into scandals, including also involving the National Election Commission, has been announced on this front as well. Both sides agreeing to collaborate on that front. Hannah, you're going to start us off with this. Uh, what's the latest? Yes. Now, South Korea's ruling People Power Party and its rival, the Democratic Party of Korea, have agreed to set up a special committee on Japan's plans to discharge radioactive wastewater from the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean starting this summer. Now, details still have to be ironed out, but the committee will be holding parliamentary hearings that could involve the 21-member team of Korean experts who who recently returned from on-site inspections of the power plant's water treatment facilities. And whom the special committee will consist of will be decided after a corresponding motion is submitted sometime next week during a plenary session and later passed. Now, the members will come from both parties and following committee-level discussions, decisions will be made when the activities will be conducted. And the parties have also agreed on a parliamentary probe into the National Election Commission currently mired in a nepotism scandal over allegations of employment favoritism shown towards the children of several senior NEC officials. And there was an urge to delve into everything going on with the election commission without any limitations on the scope of the probe. But of course, the recent employment scandal is the one that has come under the most scrutiny. And the investigation will also cover allegations that the NEC came under tens of thousands of hacking attempts by North Korea last year. Now, the commission has been suspected of failing to detect some of those attempts. Again, uh, a lot of these, it's very rare to see the uh, the ruling and the opposition party agreeing to mm -hmm. come together and uh, do special investigation. Now, the last time we've sort of seen this was uh, in regards to the, the probe into uh, who's responsible for the Ito and crowd crush, mm -hmm. right? Unfortunately, with that, there was... Uh, more more political wrangling than uh, finding the answers to what's happening. But uh, we're hoping that because of the release of the contaminated water from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant affects all of us here in Korea, that mm -hmm. uh, they might be able to finally work together on this frontier. Uh, in the meantime, this is quite interesting. Uh, the Chinese ambassador to South Korea... Uh, he didn't meet anyone from the ruling party of course uh, not. <laughs> or the government, mm -hmm. uh, but the main opposition Democratic Party leader, Lee Jae-myung, uh, delivered some strong words over South Korea's pro-U.S. stance that we've been seeing uh, since he started the UN administration. So, Pong Yang, what exactly did uh, he say? Right. So on Thursday, Chinese ambassador to Seoul, Xing Haiming, invited Lee Jae-myung, the leader of the Democratic Party, to his residence to discuss bilateral and regional issues. After exchanging greetings, Xing said that he considered Lee as his friend and that he will be honest with him. And then uh, Lee said that neighboring countries have growing concerns about Jap Japan's release of radioactive water. Xing also said that Japan was utterly irresponsible for doing so just for the benefits of his country. And while expressing concerns over the trade deficit with China, Lee asked for China's support in the denuclearization and peace process of the peninsula. Xing said that China has been keeping a close eye on Korea's trade deficit with China. Such trade deficit could be attributed to the slowdown of the global economy and the semiconductor sector. 
But Shing said that the more important reason was Korea's efforts to actually decouple from China. He continued by saying that the two countries have an inseparable economic structure and that South Korea should have more faith towards the Chinese market itself and follow the changes of its industries. Shing said that the Chinese government considers the relations with South Korea as a very crucial one, but that currently there are also many difficulties surrounding the two countries. He also said that China does not have the responsibility for that. And he also continued by stressing that Taiwan is one of the core issues with China, and the One China policy is the basis of the bilateral relations. Xing said Korea should honor its commitment regarding China and respect China's concerns. And saying that the two countries have faced external challenges and that some countries think the U.S. will win and China will fail, it is a wrong judgment and that it's about not understanding the course of history. And also later in a joint academic forum held today, Cho Tae-yong, the director of the National Security Office, said that bilateral relations should be based on mutual respect. He stressed that the country will try to build healthy relations with China based on strong diplomacy and its elevated national power. One more thing. Also, yeah. it is said that Foreign Minister Park Jin said that Xing's comments went too far this mm-hmm. time and that the ministry summoned Xing. You know, um, in some ways, uh, you can say that uh, what Xing said in regards to the trade deficit and the slowdown of the global economy, and not to mention we've been seeing a slowdown in the South Korean economy as well, that we talked about yesterday, I believe the OECD uh, downgraded uh, mm-hmm. South Korea's growth rate from like 1.7% to 1.5, I believe. Mm-hmm. And 1.5 is far lower than the uh, the global average uh, growth rate at this time. And a lot has mm-hmm. to do with the fact that, remember, South Korea is very heavily uh, reliant on exports. Yeah. And mm-hmm. who's the biggest export partner for South Korea? It's China. And so one of the things that came out, I believe, was saying that... Uh, the Bank of Korea also came out with some numbers. We were starting to get a lot of these uh, growth numbers, right? The growth we're outlooks. We're going to have that later as well. Yeah, we're going to talk about <laughs> that later mm-hmm. on. Um, but one of the things that they were saying is they, uh, there was high hopes that the reopening of the Chinese economy mm, yes. uh, was going to lead to an improved outlook mm-hmm. on some of the economies. Mm-hmm. But you're seeing, again, China is going, I don't understand why you guys are decoupling from us, <laughs> where you guys are relying so heavily on the growth of the uh, global economy on us, and you're not willing to trade semiconductors mm-hmm. and so forth. And so there is some... I guess they do have a point in this. Mm-hmm. And so it is also always very important. It's always been important to sort of balance the relationship uh, both with the United States and China. Mm-hmm. Uh, but obviously, uh, the U.S. is making that very, very difficult. Uh, also, the business chambers of South Korea and Japan agreeing on Friday to work together to realize Seoul's bid to host the 2030 World Expo over in Busan and a successful opening of this very same event in Osaka in 2025. Hannah, you have more on this? Yeah, so we were talking about the U.S. and China, but now we would like to switch gears to Japan. So the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry, known to be KCCI, said the agreement was reached with the Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, JCCI, in a joint statement adopted during the chairs meeting in Busan on Friday. Now, the Korea Chamber of Commerce, Commerce and Industry will actively participate in the Osaka Kansai Expo in 2025, and the Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry will actively cooperate to attract the Busan World Expo in 2030, the statement read. Now, the two business chambers said they will also actively promote economic cooperation and exchanges in line with improving bilateral relations. So, in the joint statement, the KCCI and JCCI agreed to join hands in addressing the aging population and low birth rates, promoting cooperation in economic security, including rebuilding the supply chains, achieving carbon neutrality, and cooperating on artificial intelligence and cybersecurity, among others. So the two parties will continue to explore specific collaboration measures with other economic organizations. And it is said the KCCI and JCCI agreed to host the next chairs meeting in Osaka in 2024. Let's move on here. We're going to talk about the economy. It certainly has been uh, very concerning because it's around this time now, the first half uh, the first half of the year is now done and over with. We're getting a lot of these uh, statistics in regards to the current uh, state of the Korean economy. And South Korea's current account recorded another deficit in the month of April. And this is uh, due to decreased dividend payments and de- uh, deficit in the travel-related accounts. But uh, 
goods balance returned to black. So uh, let's get the details of this, Bo Kyung. Sure. So according to the Bank of Korea, South Korea's current account returned to a deficit in April, reaching 790 million U.S. dollars from the 160 million U.S. dollar surplus just a month earlier. Maybe you'd remember that South Korea logged current account deficits for both January and February, which was like the first time in 11 years. Right. For instance, in January, South Korea recorded a deficit of 4.2 to 1 billion US dollars. And now that slight surplus in March unfortunately wasn't continued. And now looking into the details of April's deficit, the goods balance was in the black for the first time after seven months, recording a goods account surplus of 580 million US dollars. Now outbound shipments fell 14.2% on year to 49 Point six billion U.S. dollars on a customs cleared basis in April, due to slowing global demand for semiconductors, which is a major concern for us. Mm -hmm. And exports also fell 16.8 percent, which could be attributed to aggressive monetary tightening by major economies to curb inflation and economic slowdown. And exports have been on the decline now for like seven months in a row. And the data also shows that South Korea posted a service account deficit of 1.21 billion U.S. dollars in a April, which is a deficit for 12 consecutive months. And the deficit is mainly due to increased overseas travel since COVID-19 measures have been eased. Again, I mean, this is, uh, we've been talking about the, uh, the deficit in exports, uh, South Korea being so heavily reliant on exports. And uh, again, with uh, China being a major uh, component of, uh, you know, bringing in these uh, export figures uh, for South Korea. We're not getting the kind of figures that we used to back then. And I mean, there's a number of things uh, to look at. I mean, if you look at the statistics there, I mean, the trend in uh, decline export figures to China started ever since there was the trade uh, war between the United States and uh, uh, China. And China is also sort of, they're creating a lot of things on their own. Mm -hmm. They're relying, they're, they're, you know, there's less dependency on some of the other countries, which is going to be a major concern uh, for South Korea. But uh, when we talked to Professor Yang jun Suk a few weeks ago, he doesn't think that's a uh, short-term uh, issue at the time, but uh, maybe 10 years from now, uh, it might be a big problem. But uh, nevertheless, keeping a close tab on these uh, figures here. Uh, let's move on here. We've been talking about also uh, earlier this week, uh, we talked about the rift between mm -hmm. the government and the labor unions. Well, the police raided a major construction labor union under the uh, umbrella uh, group, uh, the, uh, the umbrella union, I should say, the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, the KCTU, this on Friday, uh, stepping up investigations into allegedly illegal overnight street rallies organized by the union in downtown Seoul last month. And this comes a day after the union said it would not appear before the police until the funeral of its late leader, Yang Hui Dong, is done and over with. So, uh, Hannah, you have more on this. Yes. Now, uh, the Seoul Namdaemun police station sent investigators to search the main office of the Korean Construction Workers Union, the KCWU, in the southwestern ward of Yongdingpo earlier in the morning and seized electric devices and documents related to the May 16th and 17th rally. So, the police have booked 29 KCTU officials, including Chang Wook Ki, the head of the KCTU. CWU on charges of violating the Assembly and Demonstration Act during the two-day rally. There is an estimated 25,000 union members staged a late-night street march toward the presidential office, and then they camped overnight in central Seoul during the rally to protest the government's labor policies. And this has caused a string of complaints over traffic congestion, noise, and, of course, other inconveniences. And a Seoul metropolitan government complaint alleging that the union used Seoul Plaza and Cheonggyecheon Plaza without permission is also under investigation. So the police have sent already four uh, summonses to Jang and another KCWU official, but they have refused to comply, citing preparations for a funeral for a fellow labor union official who died by self-immolation on May 1st. Again, I mean, there's... Uh... You know, we, we had discussions with uh, an expert in regards to this, uh, Dr. Lee Byung hoon uh, mm -hmm. over at Chungang University earlier this week. And, uh, you know, we were saying in the second half, is there going to be more conflict between the government and the, uh, the labor unions? He says, yes, uh, mm -hmm. it certainly seems this way. And again, I mean, but the, the fact of the matter is there are rules in place. If you want to take part in the, uh, the rallies and so forth, you have to, of course, get the permit. So if you're doing this without the permit and causing uh, traffic congestions mm -hmm. and so forth, 
uh, maybe there is a reason why the, the police are going into uh, going after them. But uh, nevertheless, uh, let's move on. Uh, there was an emergency economy meeting uh, presided by President Yoon suk yeol where he stressed that the global chips competition is an industrial and full-fledged national war. These were his words. Uh, Bo-kyung, uh, let's get the details of yesterday's meeting. Right. So the 17th emergency economy meeting was held on Thursday with 60 industry insiders, including CEOs, scholars, and government officials attending the meeting. And President Yoon suk yeol presided over the meeting and called for nationwide efforts to protect and boost the country's chip-making competitiveness. He literally said that competition in the global semiconductor industry is a, quote, industrial war. He mentioned the word war four times during the meeting. And it was the second time since April that a strategic meeting on key high-tech industries was held. The first one was about secondary batteries. And now this time it was about semiconductors because chips account for a fifth of South Korea's total exports and take around 55% of its manufacturing investment. Companies including Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix have been leading the industry for the past 20 years with having strength in especially memory chips. However, due to the U.S. Chips Act and global factors interrupting South Korean companies' production lines, Chinese chip makers have been slowly catching up with South Korea's market share. And now against that background, President Yoon stressed that semiconductors are South Koreans' livelihoods, their security, industry, and the economy itself, and called on ministers to remove any regulations that would act as hurdles to the companies. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy also announced on Thursday that the government plans to inject more than a billion U.S. dollars to foster key technologies in the industry, including power semiconductors, chips for automobiles, and so on. Yeah, chips for automotive Mm -hmm. uh, vehicles are the big thing right now. There's been Mm -hmm. a shortage for car semiconductors for like the longest time right Mm -hmm. now. And uh, it's still taking like uh, about a year to get some of these cars. But again, I mean, that, that's the frustrating thing, right? South Korea has been, this was a major export uh, product mm-hmm. with semiconductors and memory chips and so forth. And we've uh, talked about the frustration over the U.S. Chips Act and sort of this frustration on how the U.S. is kind of, uh, you know, gliding over South Korea, you know, cl- cloud over South Korea and telling us not to do certain things. For example, uh, taking over the, the Micron uh, market share uh, and so forth. So it's it's frustrating, but there's also much I think, uh, the, you know, President Yoon can do on the national level. The big thing is uh, globally, right. and uh, we've I've said this before. You know, back in the, uh, the mm-hmm. olden days, it was a war over uh, oil. Now it's a war over semiconductors. Mm-hmm. That's why there's so so much things going on right now, especially with the United States. They're trying to get the uh, the, the the huge share of uh, the global semiconductor market. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about some other things. That's going to be the big thing moving forward. Uh, AI mm-hmm. and uh, Chat GPT, which I'm afraid is going to start taking our jobs and stuff <laughs> like that. Uh, Sam Alt. Uh, the CEO of uh, OpenAI and the developer of uh, ChatGPT uh, visited South Korea on Friday to discuss collaboration with local startups. And now the Ministry of SMEs and Startups announced that it invited Mr. Altman to Korea and uh, held a meeting with domestic startups at the 6-3 building mm-hmm. in Yeoido. Hena, fill us in on this. Yes. So as mentioned, the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, and seven executives attended the meeting, while 100 startups were selected from the 334 startups that applied to participate in the meeting through a review of their plans for collaboration with OpenAI. Open AI and by winning a draw. The Ministry of SMEs and Startups and Altman discussed the purpose of Open AI's visit to Korea and uh, how they plan to collaborate with K startups and, of course, their intention to open an office in Korea. They also gave advice to startup founders who attended the meeting, followed by a QA session led by Altman. Now, the attendees, on the other hand, asked Altman about OpenAI's services, corporate and private pol- uh, privacy policies, copyright policies for products using ChatGPT, and other AI-related technical details, and, of course, future business directions. Now, following the meeting, it is said that Altman will participate in a fire ch- uh, side chat event hosted by SoftBank Ventures at the Yuksam building to discuss the future of AI and technology with developers, founders, and private organizations leading the domestic AI industry. It is also reported that Altman will be heading to the Yongsan presidential office later in the day. So both of you guys are uh, 
uh, translators and uh, inter- what is it? Uh, in- interpreters. Interpreters, interpreters mm-hmm. right? Are, are you guys afraid that ChatGPT and all these AI technology will eventually take your jobs? No, is it, is, I think is it's starting to take mm-hmm. the jobs of, let's say, translators oh, yeah, because I do agree. it's doing mm-hmm. a brilliant job, mm-hmm. I think, in terms of translation. Mm-hmm. But in terms of interpretation, I think not yet. We still have mm-hmm. some time to make money. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm with Pogyang on that. There's a lot of still flaws into mm-hmm. Ch- right. ChatGPT oh, or, or so Bard or something like that. One of mm-hmm. our listeners had uh, wrote on ChatGPT, who is SJ Lee? <laughs> and and uh, ChatGPT said, she is the host of Korea Now oh, on wow. Radio. Oh. So apparently, AIs think I'm a woman. So, you know, there's obviously a big flaw into this. <laughs> Work on that, Mr. Altman, mm-hmm. uh, before you try taking our jobs here. Uh, let's move on here. There are allegations that the co-founder of Terraform's mm-hmm. lab, Do Guan, had financial relations uh, with the leader of a political party in Montenegro. Oh, my mm-hmm. goodness. What's this all about? Right. So Montenegro's outgoing prime minister, Dritan Abad. Tsovich reportedly urged the country's prosecution to investigate into allegations of business connections between Do Kwan, who is the founder of Terra, and Miloko Spych, the leader of the Europe Now political movement. It is said that Kwan himself sent a handwritten letter to claim mm-hmm. this allegation, and the scandal now seems to have a great impact on the upcoming Montenegro's elections. And now, if the allegations of collusion turn out to be true, it will also solve the question of why Kwan fled to Mm-hmm. and stayed in Montenegro because we were wondering why Montenegro. Mm-hmm. And according to Montenegro's largest daily newspaper, Viesti, Prime Minister Dritan Abacovic held a press conference and said that Kwan's letter wrote that he had connections with Spych, the leader of the Europe Now movement, since 2018 and had sponsored political funds to him since then. Well, Europe Now is a new political party that was founded in June of last year. And after faring well in the local elections in October last year, the former Minister of Economy, Jacob Milatovic, who belonged to this party, was elected in the April presidential elections. And now Europe Now is leading the approval ratings in public opinion polls ahead of the general elections to be held on the 11th. And although it is not known why Kwan made such revelations just now ahead of the general elections, but Spych, who is mentioned as a potential next prime minister candidate, will be impacted by the scandal because, according to Montenegro's local law, foreigners cannot contribute to political parties or fund election campaigns. Now, political parties must report all contributions to the anti-corruption bureau of the country. And Spych denied the allegations, saying that he and the company had invested in Terraform Labs in early 2018 and that he did not receive any political funds from Kwan. He also added that the scandal was a conspiracy fabricated to prevent Europe now from winning the general elections. And the next trial against Kwan will be held on the 16th at the district court in Podgorica. Well, one of the reasons for why, allegedly, that uh, Toa Guan, uh, you know, fled to Montenegro is because uh, South Korea and Montenegro don't have the extradition mm-hmm. agreement right. in place. Uh, and so it's yeah, that's what exactly what we're seeing right now, which is mm-hmm. why Montenegro is basically saying, listen, we're going to try him first and uh, he's going to face the tr- uh, charges. And maybe once he's done with the prison sentence, which I believe is like a maximum of six years for mm-hmm. his uh, forgery charges, uh, that either the United States or you know, South Korea will get the extradition rights. But uh, there is a reason. But again, even if you don't, there is no uh, extradition agreement in place for Montenegro. And allegedly, Dogon had given money. I mean, if he wants to you know, safely hide uh, inside uh, the, the country, obviously, you know, it works out. And uh, there are certain countries out there where uh, there's, what is it? There's, there's another, uh, they call her the, the crypto queen uh, who created the, the one coin. She's still, she's scammed like billions of dollars uh, from investors and uh, she's still on the run. And they're saying mm. that one of the countries that was mentioned was Montenegro mm. because Montenegro has, uh, again, no extradition uh, agreement with a lot of these countries out there. So uh, we'll see. But uh, nevertheless, uh, continuing on with Dogwan, we have mm-hmm. Tan Sing Han, uh, who heads the probe into the uh, following crypto titan Do Guan at the Seoul Southern District's uh, prosecutor's office said on Thursday that Do Guan arrested in Montenegro was found to have siphoned off 
large sums of money. That is not surprising. <laughs> Hannah, tell us more about this. Yes. Now, Tan said in a Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg interview earlier in the day that the prosecutor's office has identified and is tracking Kwon's uh, withdrawals of $29 million, which is about $378 million Korean won, from a cryptocurrency wallet owned by Luna Foundation guard LFG since he was arrested in March. Now, on the other hand, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission uh, charged Togon with fraud in February, alleging that he stole 10,000 bitcoins, which is about $349 million at market value. They cashed them out and deposited them in a Swiss bank named Signum Bank. Now, the roughly $13 million that remains at Signum Bank is also believed to have been transferred from the LFG's wallet, Tan said, adding that the prosecutor's office is seeking to freeze the funds. But he declined to say whether South Korean prosecutors had already contacted Signum Bank, according to Bloomberg. Now, regarding Togon's extradition battle between South Korea and the U.S., Tan said Togon could serve his sentence in South Korea and then do time in the United States. Mr. Tan also said he may be sentenced to more than 40 years in prison for financial fraud in South Korea. He predicted that Kwon could face the longest sentence in the country's financial crime history. But meanwhile, the uh, Seoul Southern District Prosecutor's Office, which has been investigating the Terra Luna crash for alleged violations of the Capital Markets Act, is asking Montenegro to hand over Kwon through Department of Justice, while the United States simultaneously requested Kwon's extradition so that he could face criminal charges in the U.S. Now, the two countries have been veeing over the extradition of crypto fugitive to Guan, and it remains to be seen how it will turn out. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of the people who lost out uh, on uh, basically their life savings mm-hmm. over the crash of uh, the, the Luna coin uh, were saying that they would prefer him being extradited to the United States okay. because the United States just has a harsher punishment. Mm-hmm, right. But uh, if South, uh, you know, South Korea is coming out saying that he might be, you know, sentenced to more than forty years in prison, mm-hmm. that's a whole lot of years there. And then, and then he could face another. I don't know. You know, with the United States, they're saying life in prison wow. right now, which is again, I mean, that's longer than forty years. I'm sorry <laughs> to say. Uh, so. You know, although in cases like this, a lot of people are saying we want to see him uh, face justice here in the country. Uh, there are a lot of South Koreans who are saying just, you know, get him over there into the United States because they just have uh, tougher laws over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk weather. Um, you know, there's talks about, I don't know if you guys feel this already, but there's only, so it's, the, what is it, the second week of June now? Yeah, and it's already warm enough. Oh, it is hot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, today was something like 28 degrees. Oh, wow. Mm. I'm wearing shorts. Short, shorts are uh, August close for me. I'm already, it's <laughs> June, I'm wearing shorts right now, it is hot. Uh, they're expecting very, very uh, hot summer this mm. year. Well, we talked about the end of the La Nina mm-hmm. uh, phenomenon, and we're saying that shortly after, the El Nino phenomenon was going to start. Well, the U.S. National Weather Service did say the El Nino is here, and this is expected to uh, high, lead to higher temperatures and also heavier storms. So, Pogian, let's get the details of this. Right. So, the U.S. National Weather Service said that El Nino, which causes heat waves, floods, and droughts, began to emerge last month. On Thursday, the Center for Climate Prediction of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, issued an El Nino advisory and said the conditions of El Nino now exist and are expected to gradually strengthen through the winter of 2023 to 2024. Now, El Nino is a phenomenon in which the temperature of the sea surface in the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean in the equatorial region rises abnormally. The CPC last month said that weak El Nino conditions emerged as sea surface temperatures continued to be more than 0.5 degrees higher than the average for the previous year across the equatorial Pacific. And based on such data, the agency's climatologists projected a 56% chance that El Nino would continue through this winter, with a 56% chance of intensifying into a powerful event and about an 84% chance of becoming more moderate. Previously, the World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, also predicted in a report that the probability of an El Nino occurring in the second half of this year is increasing. The WMO diagnosed that the La Nina phenomenon, which you just mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. in which seawater in the Pacific equatorial region is lower than usual, occurred occurred in September 2020 and ended in three years. Instead, now the organization analyzed that the 
possibility of the El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomenon, in which high-temperature Western Pacific waters flow into the region, is growing. Signs of already hot and dry weather are making the world's food producers nervous. Experts predict that a strong El Nino will affect the cultivation of crops such as sugarcane and coffee and food production. A news outlet reported that right after the El Nino report came out in the U.S. that day, futures prices for sugar and coffee soared in the financial market. Yeah, and we're already seeing like inflation mm -hmm. go up and up. And I don't know if you guys saw this, and this is not really related, but get your salt if if you're if you're uh, running out short of salt right yes. now, because I thought this was a joke, right? Mm -hmm. Because they were saying because uh, you know the Japan's about to release their mm -hmm. uh, waters mm -hmm. of the Fukushima, whatever, and they were saying the people are trying to you know. You mean chanilyum? Yeah, like yeah, sea salt, sea salt. Right? Mm -hmm. sea salt. Yeah, they're they're saying that there was like a shortage of sea salt, and yeah. I thought it was lies. I was at the supermarket the other day, and there was no sea salt. Wow, mm -hmm. already they were out, and people are they're literally afraid of this. And mm -hmm. so again, all of the weathers and stuff like that, you know, it's a big concern right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about the El, the La Nina wasn't even supposed to be three years long. It's unusual mm -hmm. that it was that long, and then, there was some people saying that the El Nino that's uh, coming ahead is going to be the super El Nino, oh, and. Uh, while I was complaining about 28 degrees being very hot, we had Tuhin. Where, where are you? Where are you messaging us from, Tuhin? Uh, 48 degrees. Uh, sorry, 40 degrees here, SJ. Benny says it's 31 degrees in Manila, wow. but but again, you guys, it's normal. Isn't that like normal heat weather in Manila? That we're not used to heat like this uh, mm -hmm. here, in, here, especially in Seoul, right? These are like Daegu uh, weather. Yes. Guys, let's talk football. <laughs> uh, I. It's always hard to talk about football when they're losing. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's always when you start really uh, zoning in on the competitions. <laughs> like, no one really cared mm -hmm. in the group stages. Mm -hmm. And then the round of 16, ah, all right, they won. And then, ah, oh, quarterfinals, all right, all right. They won the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. They're in the semifinals, win this, and they're going to the finals again. Uh, they had... <laughs> The fans show up mm -hmm. uh, at Kwangawan Square. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, mm -hmm. it rained a bit uh, in the last very, night. very yeah, yeah, last yeah. night in the early morning. Yeah. So it was very wet and cold still. Uh, fans showed up and forced at Kwangawan Square, uh, like they do with the, the regular World Cup, the senior teams, mm -hmm. uh, to see South Korea lose to Italy <laughs> in the semifinals. Uh, two mm -hmm. to one was the final score. Yes. I saw it on television. Uh, Hannah, uh, tell us more about this match. Yes, okay, so it was a bit disappointing, but it was an intense match. So South Korea took on Italy for a place in the under 20 World Cup final on Friday at 6 a.m. Korea time. The Korea Football Association hosted the cheering event at Kwangomun Square with the Seoul government and the official supporters of the under 20 national football team, the Red Devils. And despite the the early hours, the uh, South Korean football fans showed their love and enthusiasm for their team. Now, moving on to the game, Italy, boasting their strongest squad, opened the scoring in the first half, but South Korea was all square nine minutes later, thanks to a penalty kick scored by Lee Sing Won. The goal brought fans from their seats shouting loudly and shaking the square with their celebration. But uh, tension, however, rose as the game went on with Italy having much of the possession. Then with only four minutes remaining, Korean hearts were broken when the Italians took the lead and ultimately won the game two goals to one. And after the match, most fans tried to cheer the young take-up warriors to give them a boost. An official said as over 1,000 people gathered, the facilities were well equipped to ensure safety. Although South Korea lost the game, there is no doubt they will be hopeful for new opportunities ahead of them you have to understand again that uh, uh, this squad that they had mm -hmm. for the under 20 mm -hmm. World Cup is I, they were guys that not a lot of people know about mm -hmm. there, there was no superstars in this right. team mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the 2019 under World Cup team at least they had Igang in oh. uh, and they had mm -hmm. some of these guys that later on I mean they, they you know big potential guys but we had a chance to talk about this with Big Yu Yuji Ho from uh, Yonap mm -hmm. News. He's our sports uh, reporter. And he was saying, anyone who says they know any of the players on the U20 team, mm -hmm. they're liars. <laughs> Because they're not big name guys, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, head coach Kim Eun Jung mm -hmm. was able to take yeah. these kids 
all the way to the semifinals. And wow. I think that's remarkable in mm -hmm. itself. Uh, and the fact that, you know, despite the fact that these are kids uh, who play in the K-League and some of them, I believe, uh, play in the, the, the second tier mm -hmm. uh, K-League challenge and so forth, uh, being able to g get this far. Uh, I always say this, but the future of South Korean football is it's, bright. Yes. It really is. And, uh, you know, the fact that there's also a thousand people that showed up, a lot mm -hmm. of people might be going, a thousand people? It was six in the morning <laughs> on, a, on, on a Friday, mm -hmm. and it was raining, the floors were wet. And so, really, you have to give it to them. And I know uh, one of the things I really like is the fact that despite the fact that they were knocked out, uh, they were unable to go to the, the mm -hmm. finals, uh, they got really far. And, uh, right. you know, Italy is just uh, it's just a completely different mm -hmm. team. I believe uh, South Korea will be facing off against Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, cheers for Israel, by the way. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> you guys think I'm joking. No, I mean, I lived there. So, <laughs> so uh, I will cheer for Korea. Yeah, that, so that's, uh, I believe that's going to be 2.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Argentina time. Mm. And then that's going to be 2.30 uh, a.m. Uh, Monday morning uh, Korea time. So continue to cheer on for the uh, the South Korean national football, uh, the under national team there. And uh, the future of Right. Football team is bright. Guys, thank you as always for coming in today with your reports. Have a fantastic and safe weekend, and we'll see you guys again. Thank Have you. A good weekend. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.